Okay, so um, I think we need to go ahead and get started with our program. So I hate to interrupt conversations, which are all um, still ongoing, but uh, hopefully we can carry them into lunch. Uh, I'd like to get uh, to our keynote perspective, which um, I'm very happy to um, introduce uh, Gwenaëlle Avis Hewitt. Uh, she's the CEO of Angie North America, as well as the Executive Vice President at Angie in charge of the renewable and hydrogen business uh, in France and the Global Renewable Business Line. Um, Gwenelle is not going to stand at the podium. She is uh, much more of a rock star than any of the rest of us. So she will actually address you. Um, she's mic'd up uh, uh, sort of from the floor. Um, we will have some time at the end of her remarks for some questions. So uh, I ask you please, if you do have a question once she's done, to come to the mics in the aisles so that we can call on you uh, uh, in due course. Gwenelle? Thank you. Yours. Hello everybody, um, I'm very happy to be there today and to share with you our vision around zero carbon transition journey because things are happening very fast across the world and especially here in the US. We were last week in the climate week in New York and it was incredible how the momentum is there. All the heads of states and governments start talking about it. All the big corporates start talking about it. The citizens are also talking about it. So it's the right topic at the right moment. And just to share with you, what is Engie? What is the role of Engie in this transition, in the momentum that we see today? Engie is a global company. We have 160,000 people across the world, and their job is working on the energy transition. It was not the case in the past. I will tell you the story. But now we've got all those teams, all those people, the employees working on the zero carbon transition journey mainly on three areas, and I will get back to that, on renewables, on services, meaning energy efficiency, how can we consume less energy? And the last point is networks. How can we reinforce our gas networks across the world? Mainly today we are doing more than $70 billion a year, so it's a big company. Maybe it's not well known, but we used to say our company is previously called GDF Suez, but we've been through a tremendous transformation within our group. And this is something noticeable and sometimes people realize that NG is, well, a new company. It's a new company. Why is that? In the past, we used to do thermal generation across the world, big plants, the biggest as possible. So big plants across the world. And four years ago, we decided only to focus on energy transition. Walk the talk. Everybody is talking about climate change. We should make it reality. And we should pave the way for this transformation. So that's why our activities today are threefold. The first one is client solutions. What it means when I was talking about energy efficiency, it's a way to reduce carbon emission. It's, it is to say we will consume less energy because we will perform better in our assets, in our day-to-day -day life, so we will consume less energy. And this is a big part of our activities. We've got 110,000 people across the world dedicated to services. So we design, we operate, we manage, and we finance infrastructure, such as heating and cooling networks, cogeneration, distributed generation, solar, for example. So basically, this is client solutions. The second part is renewable. A few years ago, we were nowhere in renewable. Even here in the US, we had no megawatt, no capacity. We were not present. And today, we've got 24 gigawatt across the world. And we are developing three gigawatt a year. So it's big. It's very big. And this acceleration, we just put all our efforts on renewable and client solutions. And the last one is to make it work with networks. So the networks part is the third component, because at the end of the day, we need to rely on networks. For gas, is also preparing the networks to green gas. So investment in green hydrogen, investment in biomethane. So these are our, our activities as of today. But to do that, we've been through this transformation, as I mentioned before. And to do that, we had to invest in innovation, because things are progressing so fast. All those technologies that we are talking about, they were very, very expensive a few years ago. They were not affordable. And if we want energy transition to happen, it should be affordable. It should be uh, uh, available for anybody 
So the cost should decrease fast. So the innovation part is really important in the energy transition journey because we need to invest in the technologies of the future. Just take one example. Renewable, it's great, but you don't have sun all the time. You don't have wind all the time. And if you only rely on sun and wind, you have a problem. So we need to invest in storage. We need to invest in green hydrogen. We need to invest in batteries. It is costly, yes, it is. But we need to invest right now, because in five years' time, for example, costs would have decreased very, very fast. And at some point, it will become the only solution that makes sense. So that's why, for us, innovation is also a key driver in our zero carbon transition journey. We've invested in green hydrogen, we've invested in green mobility, and we've invested in hybrid solutions, solar plus storage, for example, things like that, hybrid solutions. Basically, as we see the, the momentum today, is that in the past, renewables were developed by large government. They were wanting to develop renewables, so you had big schemes supporting renewables. Now it started from the ground, from citizens, from employees, from corporates that are saying, I want to decarbonize, I want to, to have a role in the planet, and I want to uh, invest in that on the long term. And so we see the momentum shifting from government towards cities, local authorities, uh, uh, citizens, employees, so more decentralized. And this is an element that is absolutely noticeable. It's not only decarbonization, it's also decentralization. It starts now from the ground. So just one element about climate change, everybody is talking about that, and that's for sure. Why energy is so important is this debate? because it's a good part, it's a very important part of the carbon emissions. So investing in the energy transition is reducing carbon. And why it is so important? Because every year, you know, the day that we are consuming all the resources of the planet is, bef is, is, is the day before. So for example, this year, the Earth overshoot day was on July 29th, and it was the earliest ever recorded. So we have a role to play in that. So our ambition as NG is to invest in this zero carbon transition. How to do that? First is to walk the talk. It's good to talk about climate change. It's even better when you walk the talk. So that's why in four years, we divested 15 billion. We just sold many assets across the world, thermal generation assets, and we reinvested the 15 billion on renewable climate solutions meaning energy efficiency and all those kinds of solutions, and innovation. Innovation in terms of technology, but also innovation like digital. Digital will be a key enabler of all this energy transition. So that was extremely fast. Sometimes we think big corporates, that's difficult to move. With 160,000 employees, that's difficult to move. But in fact, we did it in only four years. So that means that with a very courageous decision, we can pave the way for the future, and we are very proud of that. So now, what do we do? Basically, we are reducing energy consumption, we are replacing and renovating infrastructure to have less energy consumed, we supply green energy, we leverage big data, we operate installations, and we finance investments. For example, we signed a green PPA with L'Oréal in Brazil, so it's, it's a plan dedicated to L'Oreal in Brazil. We do that more and more, even in the US, because US, it's the corporate PPAs are becoming bigger and bigger, and so we, have, we are developing more and more contracts. The question that you may raise is that, okay, you're developing a wind farm for a particular cl client, but there is no wind all the time, so how they manage the intermittency of renewable? And that's a good question. First, our clients, they were saying, I want a dedicated farm for my consumption. So we were building farm dedicated for one particular client. And they were saying, okay, that's not enough. I want much more. I want renewable green energy that matches exactly my consumption. What can you do? That's a good question. So we looked at the profiles of production of different technologies. And for example, here in Texas, you've got a good match between wind and solar. The profiles are very complementary. 
So for example, last week we announced a corporate PPA with Microsoft that is a 24-7 corporate PPA. That means that they will rely on a green energy available 24-7. And it's based in Texas. It's a 100% renewable Texas solution. So that's nice. And we see the future that way. From us produced, meaning the energy that is produced from a wind farm, it's not enough. We should go towards 24-7 available solutions for clients. So basically, that's the kind of solutions that we are developing. We're investing quite a lot on that. And we really believe that it will be an enabler if it is affordable. And for me, the missing link today is storage and green hydrogen. And that's why it's so important to dedicate resources to make it happen. So the story is the same in North America. We used to be big in North America. We had thermal generation. But today, the movement is there. North America, the development of renewable is incredible. Let's take uh, wind, for example. Today, the capacity of wind is 100 gigawatt. So just to give an order of magnitude, it's the world production of power for France, for a country like France, but just with wind. So it's really important. And Texas is a quarter of this production. So Texas is a big, big, big state in terms of wind production. Solar is the same. Solar, the capacities are 64, but uh, the progression has been very fast. In 10 years, it's an increase of 75%. So the momentum is there. Things are happening already here in the US. How is that? First, companies are very much involved in this energy transition journey. There are numbers of companies that are members of an initiative that is called Renewable 100. I want to consume 100% renewable for my consumption. So more and more companies are members of this initiative. So it starts from companies. It starts also from cities, like the C40. It's, again, an initiative gathering cities that want to play a role in this decarbonization journey. And Houston is part of it. So yes, the momentum is there. When we see New York also, they've decided a very, very ambitious initiative. They want to be carbon neutral by 2050 with a target that is closer in 2030, that is reducing their emission by 40%. So the momentum is there. It starts from the corporate, it starts from the cities, it starts from the citizens and the employees. Energy transformation is the same in the US. As I mentioned, we were big in the US, operating many thermal generation, coal plants, gas plants, LNG, EMP, so exploration of production. What did we do? We sold. We sold everything and we said, okay, we will reinvent an energy in the US. So today we are focusing on customer solutions, renewable and supply to green the supply of uh, our clients. Two thirds of our employees are new because basically we had to rebuild a new energy and we did that in three years. So I mean, that's, that's really a challenge. Now we have to progress to make it known and to gain visibility in this area, but we did it. And just maybe one movie, just to show you what we've been through, if you allow me. I'm Jim Lavelle, and I'm general manager of Holyoke Gas and Electric. Utility projects are difficult. You know, you have to have a good partner to make these projects a success. It's been a very good partnership with NG. We were able to work together to transform a coal generation facility to a very successful renewable energy project that includes community solar and battery storage. So hge &E customers have signed up to be participants in taking energy from that parcel at the coal plant that has over 17,000 solar panels. And that was the largest solar array in New England at the time, in October 2017. We have looked uh, and have endeavored to uh, launch battery storage for quite a while, several years. HGE and e was very interested in finding storage solutions to help manage our peak demand, as well as add resiliency to our distribution system. After NG acquired Green Charge Networks uh, and their teams 
uh, combined and their commitment to making it work was the difference in uh, getting this over the finish line. Feedback from all corners on this project has been extremely positive. Locally, regionally, our regulators, policy makers, and we consider these projects huge successes. So it's just to show you the transition. We were a coal player, okay, but at some point it's good to invest in the new generation capabilities. And so, so that's why we need to engage with clients to show what's possible, what's not possible, what's available in terms of technology, what the costs are, but to engage this discussion. And so that's what we did and that's what we, we expand uh, now in North America. So today we are mainly focused on the activities on uh, renewable customer solution and supply, which is a component of customer solution. Uh, we have 6,500 6, employees, two thirds are new, as I mentioned, because they were not part of the story in the past. We are doing 4 billion in the US uh, in terms of revenue. But what is interesting is the dynamic, is the momentum. We started from scratch. And I, I have the privilege also to be in charge of the renewable for NG worldwide, not only in the US, but worldwide. And we have announced that we will develop three gigawatt a year, three gigawatt a year, which position us as a top, one of the top leader in terms of development. And what I explained to the market is among the three gigawatt that we will build, one third will be here in the US, one third of our ambition. So US is a very, very important market for us. And why is that? Because there is a momentum here. Because we see the corporates that are engaged into this decarbonization journey. And there is, uh, I would say, uh, momentum at the state's level at the same time. So we will continue to invest to increase our development here in the US, and we really believe in it. Customer solution is also one big element. Is when we discuss with clients, it's not only building renewable, it's really managing all the assets just to make sure that we consume less energy, just to make sure that we have the best installation and the consumption is lower. And I will give you just one example. Now for renewable, concrete example. A year ago, no megawatt in the US, as I mentioned. We had no megawatt in the US, so we were not present in this market. Now we have already 1.3 gigawatt installed and we are developing one gigawatt a year. So it's just to show that we can start from scratch, but if we have the ambition, if we dedicate enough resources, enough attention, we can deliver. So now the momentum is there for renewable. We are doing both solar and wind, and we do believe on the complementarity of the technologies. We are also investing on others like offshore, of biomethane, things like that, because they are very complementary. And at the end of the day, we will have to deliver 24 seven available green energy to our clients, like baseload, fully available. And that's a challenge. That's what we did for Microsoft. It was for their Titan Center in San Antonio. And we did it with wind farms, with solar farms here in, the, in Texas. So it's also distributed generation meaning we invest on sites where the client is. And for example, we did 500 solar installations across 31 states, over 180 energy storage projects at the same time. So yes, distributed generation is also one big component of the development. Now customer solution. Sometimes it can be a bit um, confusing because it's so broad. We don't know exactly what it means. Energy efficiency, exactly what does it mean? Just maybe give you one example. Uh, we, we were discussing with Ohio State University. It's a very big uh, university. And they wanted to uh, invest in their facilities, you know, energy facilities. They are the cogeneration, they are networks, eating, cooling, things like that. And so we said, OK, why not entering into 50 years partnership? And we will invest for you. So that's what we did. We have people in the university, but not only working on their installation, but investing in new installations. So with this contract, this long-term partnership, 50 years, we already invested 1.3 billion. 
and we will invest three times more to refurbish all their installations to make sure that they reduce their consumption and our objective is to reduce their consumption by 25% in 10 years. So we invest in their infrastructure. At the same time, we invest in academic collaboration for scholarship, for internship, for numbers of things, and we will build, a, we will build an innovation center in the center of the university, 50 million for an innovation center with new technologies and asking startups to go there. So, I mean, when it comes to client solutions, it's very broad in terms of scope. It's entering into long-term partnership, 50 years, where we can invest billions, but to make sure that they have the best technology in class and they reduce their carbon footprint. So that's what we did in Ohio State, and that's what we are doing also in Longwood Medical Hospital in Boston. So our project here in the US, it's very simple. Deploy zero carbon transition journey. It's a very simple world. It's so complicated, in fact. But with the motivation, with the energy, because we are very much dedicated only to that, and with the appropriate focus, we can deliver. And that's what we did in only three years. So to do that, we will continue to increase our investments on renewable. We will engage much more on long-term partnerships with clients helping them to reduce their carbon emission, to reach sustainability journey, and caring of our people. This is a key element. We are building a company from scratch. So caring of our people, making sure that they understand the meaning of what we are doing is really a key component of success. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, Robert Schwager with Condor International. Could you talk a little bit about if you have any strategy focused on uh, Latin America for development and continued projects? Yes. So in Latin America, um, we still have some coal, coal plants in Chile. And we are currently discussing with the governments on the phase out of our coal plants in investing in renewables at the same time. So this discussion is already happening. We cannot close our coal plants today because it's forbidden. We need to have the agreement from the, from the authorities. But we are proposing them a full plan to replace coal generation by renewable. So this is for Chile, it's a very important country for us, and in terms of energy transition, we have to deliver that message. So this is the first element. In Brazil, we are very big, we have large hydro, and we are developing wind and solar. In Mexico, it's also the same. We have developing wind and solar, and the momentum is there, even though there is no more auctions from the states, it's mainly driven by corporate PPAs. But you know, it's very close to the US, so we can explain how it works there and how we can engage into discussion with corporate to make it happen. So I would say there are different challenges across Latin America. The momentum is very different, but in any case, we are engaging discussion to decarbonize the footprint in those countries. Uh, Mike Sloan with Virtus Energy. And um, your plans for renewable energy development, especially large scale, require a lot of infrastructure. There's infrastructure challenges already. Does that change your strategy? And do you have some maybe ideas how we could expand infrastructure here in the United States? You mean transmission? Transmission lines yeah. primarily, just ways to get more large scale renewables on. Yeah, you're right. Um, so transmission line is absolutely critical to make uh, renewable flow, and we know that uh, the impact on renewable on the equilibrium of the transmission line is, is very important. So this is a challenge, and you know that it is even more a challenge because transmission line is very difficult to build. New transmission line is very much a challenge. So that's why uh, we see clo development of renewable closer to clients' consumption. This is something that is requested by many clients. They don't want to rely on something that is remoted. And that does not mean that we will never rely on transmission line, because obviously we will. 
But at the same time, we will need to invest much more on uh, renewables that are closer to clients, and, and especially with combination of solar plus storage or wind plus storage, so that we minimize the impacts on the transmission. Um, and lastly, what we are doing today is that we are putting in place blockchain on our assets just to track the electrons and to show the link between consumption and production. So this is the stage just after. Um, congratulations on your expansion here in the United States. Um, how, what, have your, what have been the biggest challenges for, in the regulatory space for your expansions here in this country? So the question that was raised to me is that the evolution of the ITC and the PTC, you know, the fiscal incentives that we have in the US, is it with the decrease of those schemes, does that mean that renewable will stop here in the US? Our position, it's not the case. We believe that renewable will continue to develop because they've reached a very competitiveness price and they will continue to develop. So I would say that those schemes, they were very good to launch renewable, but now what we would need is much more something like carbon, carbon price, to incentivize much more decarbonization across the country. And in any case, it's not one country, it's like 50 or even more, because it's sometimes developed by, incentivized by cities. And so what we would like to see is much more, it's, it's continuation of the commitments of the cities and the states towards decarbonization. Hi, Gwinnell. I'm Beth Hunter with SockGen. And uh, thank you so much for your presentation. I'd love to get Angie's views on the timeline and the, uh, for the development of economic large-scale storage and batteries. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. First, it depends on the location, and second, it depends on the usage. Uh, so that's why for us it's not only batteries that we should look at because depending on the consumption and depending on the location it's, it may be also green hydrogen and we have, uh, we have the feeling that green hydrogen may become more competitive more rapidly. So that's why we are working on the two par in parallel. Uh, today there is no economic rationale for large scale storage but we see that you know what has been done for solar or for wind, the decrease of the cost was so fast, nobody anticipated that. So that's why we need to be on the two tracks, batteries and green hydrogen. And green hydrogen is very good value because back to the question on transmission, what do we, what do, we do? We just capture the excess of production of wind. For, for example, sometimes there is wind blowing but no consumption. So what we do, we, we extract this excess of consumption we do an electrolysis of the water, and with that we produce hydrogen. And hydrogen, you can store it. So at the end of the day, it's a way to store the renewable that you don't consume. So it's a good way also to see that storage with renewable is achievable. Today it's not competitive, but we need to do the two tracks in parallel. Great. Um, well, everybody, uh, we're up against the time, and, and it's funny, I was going to ask two questions, and, and the last three people that stood up basically took my thunder, so that's great. Uh, Gwinnell, thank you very much. Everybody, please join me in thanking you for being here. Okay, and with that, I'd like to invite um, Jeffrey Wood, partner of Baker Botts, to come to the stage and uh, introduce your panel. Thank you. Well, good morning and welcome to panel two of the Baker Institute Forum on Energy Transition, Legacy Scale, and Technology. In the first panel, we heard a vibrant discussion about the current state of energy transition, market forces, deployment of solar and other renewables, governmental policies and traditional utility models, legal and permitting difficulties. My name is Jeff Wood, and I'm honored to moderate the second panel, which brings together insightful perspectives from government, academia, and corporate viewpoints to illuminate the path forward 
in the energy transition. On this panel, we will consider an array of topics with global energy usage expected to grow by nearly 50% by 2050, what are the hurdles, challenges, and opportunities for deploying new energy technologies at a large scale? What is the short and long-term viability of advanced energy technologies, like renewables, electric vehicles, small modular nuclear reactors, battery storage, CCS, and the like, to meet the nation's and the world's energy needs with less environmental impact? What challenges, environmental and geopolitical, to energy transition are posed by, by the production and use of critical minerals, essential inputs to many alternative energy technologies? What is the role of export credit financing and development financing in our energy future? How is U.S. industry investing in lower carbon emission technology? Will American innovation continue to lead the way for the rest of the world? And what role will fossil fuels have in our energy future? On this panel, we are honored to be joined by an esteemed group of experts. I'll ask them to come up at this moment. First, we have Tristan Abbey, a senior professional staff member at the U.S. Senate Committee on Energy and Natural Resources, under the leadership of Chairman Lisa Murkowski. Tristan most recently served on the National Security Council staff in the White House, in the Strategic Planning and International Economics Directorates, and on the transition team at the U.S. Department of Energy. Next, Michelle Foss, who is currently the Fellow in Energy and Minerals at the Baker Institute. Michelle has nearly 40 years of experience in senior positions in energy and environmental research, consulting and investment banking. Over the past three decades, Michelle has directed research on energy value chain economics and commercial frameworks to support energy investment worldwide while serving in various positions at the University of Texas, at Austin, and the University of Houston. Next, we have William Swetra, a low carbon strategy analyst at Oxy Low Carbon Ventures, LLC a wholly owned subsidiary of Occidental Petroleum Corporation. In William's current role, he focuses on carbon capture, utilization, and storage policy, carbon trading programs, greenhouse gas mitigation issues, among other things. Last, we're honored to be joined by Todd Staples, the president of the Texas Oil and Gas Association, which represents the Texas oil and gas industry, including small, independents, and major producers. Collectively, the membership of Texoga produces in excess of 90% of the state's crude oil and natural gas, operates over 80% of the state's refining capacity, and is, re is responsible for the vast majority of the state's pipelines. Todd previously served as the Texas Agriculture Commissioner and as a member of the Texas Senate and House. Under his leadership, Texoga continues its mission of promoting a robust oil and natural gas industry and advocating for sound, science-based policies and free market principles. Thank you all for taking time to be here with us today. We will begin with introductory mark remarks by each of our panel members, followed by a period of moderated discussion, and hopefully we'll have time for audience Q&A. So with that, let me turn it over to Trist Tristan, and I need to hand you the clicker. Thanks, Jeff, for, for that wonderful introduction, and thanks to the Baker World for having us all here today. Uh, my name is Tristan Abbey. As Jeff mentioned, uh, my background is both on the Hill and the executive branch. I uh, spent the past two, two and a half years at uh, DOE and the NSC. Uh, it's no coincidence that uh, this Strategic Energy for America Act was, was released uh, uh, after I came out of the administration and, and rejoined the Hill, having learned a lot about uh, the issues that the United States faces globally. Uh, on the left here, you, you've got a, an op-ed that my boss wrote in the Washington Times. It's a great layout, and I just have it up there so you can see the cover of the white paper, uh, which is also conveniently displayed. Uh, the white paper is, 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 uh, is sort of the foundational architecture uh, that defines what this strategic energy initiative is. The white paper was released back in July. It's entitled, With Powers So Disposed, which is a quote from George Washington's uh, famous farewell address. Uh, everybody knows about this farewell address mostly because of, of, of Washington's reference to foreign entanglements and uh, the kinds of uh, virtues that American leaders and, and the nation would need 
Uh, but there's also a very interesting discussion about free trade and commerce. Uh, obviously, Washington was uh, in favor of American commerce, uh, in favor of the free flow of goods and, and capital and people, but uh, he also... But he he also made uh, made reference to uh, powers that the U.S. government would have to exercise in order to ensure that that trade was fair, with powers so disposed. Uh, and so that is the the basis of uh, this initiative, the Strategic Energy uh, Initiative, which uh, basically takes the world as it is, that is, U.S. competitive uh, marketplace globally. We're one player among many. Uh, we are energy dominant today, it is true. Uh, when the administration talks about energy dominance, it is in part uh, a nice slogan, but it's also in part a description of, of reality. Uh, but it is also a description of potential opportunity. Uh, what does it mean to be energy dominant? Who are we trying to dominate, as one British oil company asked me one day. Uh, the answer is nobody, we're not trying to dominate anybody, just a, just a nice slogan. But um, on the right side of the, of the slide here, we have a discussion draft of the Strategic Energy for America Act, the C Act. Everybody loves acronyms on the Hill. Um, the fact that acronym was chosen very carefully uh, to make sure that the acronym uh, said something. Uh, not that it's particularly awesome. You know, there are other things like EPACT 05 that sound cooler. Uh, I'm not sure ESA 07 sounds really cool, but but who? but some folks talk about that still. Uh, what the SEA Act does, uh, first of all, it's just a discussion draft. It's not even an introduced bill. Uh, on Congress, you have a number of tools to, to lay out ideas. You can put out white papers, you can host hearings, you can write op-eds, you can have speeches, uh, you can give floor remarks. Uh, but uh, uh, typically, people think about the Hill, they think about legislation. That certainly, one of the primary roles of, of a uh, member of Congress is to introduce legislation. Uh, but one of the downsides of introducing an actual bill is that then you force people to say yes or no. Uh, they have to commit to the text of the bill, to its contents, um, and short of introducing a new bill or amending it as it goes forward, there really is no way to change it. Whereas in a uh, little used uh, mode, the discussion draft, you can release something and just have a discussion about it. Um, and these days, I think it's kind of rare to have a, g a genuine discussion in D.C., uh, but that's certainly something that we're trying to foster with this paper. So given that the United States is in a competitive marketplace, that we are competing with other countries, that we, even though we are currently energy, do energy dominant, perhaps for the first time in, in a generation or more, uh, you know, other countries aren't just going to sit back and let us enjoy our uh, our abundance and prosperity. Uh, they will also try to compete. Um, in fact, uh, one could argue that absent the oil shocks of the 70s, absent the 90s, absent the early 2000s, you wouldn't have had the oil and shale revolution, that, but the oil and gas shale revolution that we've seen. It's, it's, it was a response to things that happened uh, in some ways. Um, and so we can't just sit back and rest on our laurels. If you look at the, this current decade, the 2010s, or the teens, um, the, the first half of it was really, when, when it comes to energy policy, a debate about uh, making sure that American energy could or could not be exported globally. You look at LNG, you look at coal, you look at crude oil, petroleum products, natural gas liquids. The first half of this decade or so was a debate in DC about to what extent we should be exporting liquefied natural gas, to what extent should we, we be approving liquid pipelines, whether it's from Canada or from the U.S. to Mexico, uh, whether we should continue to allow exports of uh, natural gas without um, uh, too much onerous environmental review, uh, whether the State Department should be in charge of oil pipelines like the Keystone Crossing, uh, whether the ban on crude oil exports should be lifted or not. This was the debate, and the debate was, I think, fairly firmly resolved in favor of exporting. Now, that applies to the raw commodity, oil, gas, gasoline, uh, which is not necessarily raw, it's already refined, but, but um, 
we're, we're, we're talking about the actual energy fuel here as being exported. Uh, the, the conversation that didn't happen in the, in the early 2010s was about uh, infrastructure and large-scale uh, uh, projects that would enable more American energy to be consumed overseas. And so here we start to, th to think about LNG import terminals. We start to think about civil nuclear reactors in other countries. We start to think about uh, ways of boosting demand for American energy in whether it's a developing country or not, uh, uh, all of which uh, contributes to American exports, a lower trade deficit, economic growth, jobs, and all that good stuff. Um, so I'll just wrap up my opening remarks briefly by going through the Sea Act and letting you know what it says. So the Sea Act looks at the Export-Import Bank, a subject I'm sure we will return to, and it reauthorizes it for 12 years. It raises the exposure cap to $200 billion from, from $135 billion today, uh, and it creates a $50 billion strategic energy portfolio. Uh, the, the point of this is to send a strong message that the chairman of the Energy Committee in the U.S. Senate uh, is in favor of a strong, robust export-import bank function. Uh, often in D.C., the only side we hear from are those who want a weaker, uh, less effective, frankly, XM. Second, uh, we address the uh, brand new Development Finance Corporation, which used to be known as OPIC, or the Overseas Private Investment Corporation. This focused on developing countries, uh, and one of the things that we do there is remove the self-imposed ban on civil nuclear projects that OPIC imposed uh, back during the previous administration. And for some reason, this administration has uh, not taken steps to to change. It is not a law, it's not a regulation, There's, it's, it's not a rulemaking, it's just an internal policy that they've decided we will not support civil nuclear. And then finally, we direct the uh, Treasury Department uh, to exercise its voice and vote at multilateral development banks to oppose restrictions on basically any type of energy fuel to the exclusion of others. Uh, and. Uh, uh, the U.S. vote, of course, is substantial. It's not a majority in any of these banks. Uh, but what's the point of having 17, 18, 20 percent of the voting power if you never bother to exercise it in your interest? Um, and so that's really what the concept of strategic energy is about. It's making sure uh, the U.S. Uh, as a nation uh, is able to export its energy uh, where it needs to go and that we're able to compete uh, and emphasize triple underline the word compete in a very competitive global marketplace. All right. Um, I think we need to switch slide decks. And while that's happening, what I'll um, do is mention um, that early in my career, um, I actually spent quality time in coal and non-fuels minerals, um, extraction, um, quality time with the mining industry and minerals businesses, um, really enjoyed that a whole lot, then kind of made sort of a permanent switch to uh, mainly oil and gas, mainly natural gas and LNG for many, many years, and, and have sort of returned to my roots for a reason, and, and the reason is that here at the Center for Energy Studies with Ken's leadership and all of us um, uh, collaborating as best we can, what we're trying to do is think about um, the details of what we are all talking about in the concept of an energy transition. Um, and most of those details involve uh, the critical minerals, elements, um, parts of the periodic table <laughs> that nobody remembers or thinks about. Um, and and um, and and where those where those are going to be used, where they're going to be needed, what we're using today that we're going to have to keep using, what's going to happen when we start growing demand for things that are going to need to go into specialized applications in um, in new energy technologies, um, so that we can start to think about this um, systematically. Um, when you're starting a new program, actually. What you do is you have a workshop. Brilliant idea, right? Um, and to do this, what we did was to bring together some of the leaders in battery science research, because that is a very big consumer 
of minerals and materials and energy, um, along with people who are very familiar with the extractive minerals businesses, um, people who are looking at some of the different applications. And then because we think this is a very under-discussed topic, um, people who are starting to think about the environmental consequences of all of this, um, life cycle consequences of the things that we do, and how they compare to the, to the, the things that we're already using. Um, we organized it to try to address some basic questions on drivers and uncertainties, um, disruptive substitutes. I mean, we, we, there are a lot of things out there that we could think about that would cause future outlooks that we've been discussing today to be different. Uh, the main drivers that um, could slow down or speed up research and development, that's a really critical one because the faster things can get off of the bench, pre-commercialization, commercialization, and so on, then the better off we'll be able to be doing some of the things we're ambitious to do. And then for us internally um, at CES and here at the Baker Institute, what should we be doing on this? What, are our, what should be our research priorities? How do we think about these things and package them together the right way? And so what I'm going to do is share with you some of what got discussed at the workshop along with um, some of the things that have popped up in about a year of scoping um, across all of these things. Um, and then previous years, while I was still at the Bureau of Economic Geology before retiring from UT, when we started dabbling in this to try to understand better um, what could happen with minerals profiles. And so to kind of plunge into that, try to be quick about it, um, the big picture, slowly, 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 realizations happen, right? And slowly, there, and, and it's becoming documented, and it's in the, in the public domain, um, and it's ending up at places like um, Senator Murkowski's uh, committees and with good staffers like Tristan. Um, we're coming to realize that the energy applications that we want to make use of in the, in the future, for a whole variety of very good reasons, are actually more materials and minerals intensive than the things that we're using today. And this is an interesting thing to ponder. Um, it's certainly something that can change with research and development, technology advances, and other things. Generally, though, this touches on the portfolio of options that we've been talking about mostly today, everything from electric vehicles and shifts in transportation um, to wind and solar, um, the, the components associated um, with capturing those resources, dispatching them, and the energy storage to make all of this work. Um, we're also in a very slow realization, and here the, the conversations are probably even more interesting, um, that the US and, and the OECD in, in general are not very well positioned on all of this. Um, we barely have a mining industry in the US today versus when I was a, a, a young professional starting out. Um, even in countries that still have robust mining industries like Canada, um, there have been a lot of changes on that front. Um, we have a lot of reluctance to support extractive industries and minerals processing in our countries. Our resources, um, because we've extracted a, um, some of the higher quality stuff, are not as good as what we can find in frontier areas. Um, but then there's this very particular problem that was, um, has already come up, and that is China. And it doesn't matter where you look in all of this, China dominates the minerals and materials supply chains. They are aggressive in controlling intellectual property. Um, they certainly are aggressive in controlling and investing in manufacturing capacity to produce a lot of this. Um, one of the interesting things is that when we look at what everybody thinks they understand about falling costs for things, it doesn't matter what it is, wind, solar, uh, battery energy storage, or whatever, if you overlay on that trends in manufacturing growth in China and trends in their control of critical supply chains for that, it's a perfect match. Um, and so really, um, this is, I would say, a distinct business risk that people really need to think about. Um, because if something were to happen in that, and we had to actually pick up pieces of that capacity and do it ourselves, it would not look the same in terms of cost structure. Um, 
Are we trading one set of energy risks for another? So this is kind of a bothersome question that um, was sort of in the backdrop as we went about this. I've been bothering my colleague Mark Finley about it a lot. It's something that I think we need to think about a great deal here at the, at the center and in the Baker Institute in general. What do we need to think about with regard to minerals security? We used to stockpile minerals. We decided that was a bad business to be in. We got rid of that. Do we need to start thinking about that again for things that are really strategic, really important? Now this is slopping over into the Department of Defense in various uh, interesting ways. Um, if we have to replace that security paradigm that Mark talked about earlier that we have in place for, for global oil and we have to do a similar thing for minerals, how long will it take? How much will it cost? How does it need to be organized? These are all really huge questions. Um, quickly, to, to try to order the thinking on all of this, um, one of the things that I tried to do was to come up with a, a framework um, that captures the, the operational considerations. So um, pardon me, but this is a bit of Exxon speak. Everybody calls this something different, but um, she is safety, security, health, and environment, which is a big, huge bucket of things that have to be done across value chains in order to execute properly. Um, to protect workers, protect um, property, um, protect the environment in general, protect the public. Um, we can't think about um, how to operate without thinking about what the pull, the demand pull is going to be. Um, this has to stretch all the way from extraction to end use, and there's a lot on the end use side that we have to look at. The second major um, point coming out of the workshop was kind of a defining thing going into it. What we demand in minerals is really gonna be driven by the apps that we chase. But there's a corollary, which is the apps that we chase can only be done if we can get the materials and the minerals that we need to do them, right? So this is a chicken or egg problem at a royal scale. Um, and we can see it across the board. It doesn't matter what you look at. Um, advanced solar, um, new ideas on battery chemistries to improve performance and safety and um, performance of electric vehicles. I mean, it just doesn't matter where you look. People are constrained by what's available to them, where they're gonna get it, how they're gonna get it, um, and, and control the intellectual property of the things that they're coming up with along the way. There are lots of disruptors lurking in the wings, and, and there are some really interesting disruptors out there that, that um, we wanted to, to spend at least a bit of time thinking about. Um, this will come up later, but there are advances and ideas about fusion energy. Well, that's a really interesting and big disruptor. Um, here at, at Rice and at other universities, there, we're rethinking carbon, the building block of life. Can we use it a different way? Can we deploy it a different way? Um, can we do things with carbon that, that you know, really stretch the envelope um, of what we can pursue? But a really interesting disruptor to think about because of all of the other uh, unintended consequences that we're, we're trying to, to poke at um, on all of our alternative energy technologies is whether our conventional energy technologies actually start to look better. Um, maybe they perform better because Advances are happening there too. I mean, we all know this. I drive an SUV today that could get 500 miles on a full tank. 15 years ago, I wasn't even close to that, right? I mean, you know, you have to think about this stuff. And so we put that on the table to be fair and open, full disclosure, all of that stuff. We talk a lot to the extent that the realization is starting to happen out there about minerals and accessing minerals. We talk a lot about ores and accessing ores and the countries where they're located and places where the Chinese got there first and we can't get there, things that, you know, the, the, the raw materials that they control, but processing is a really big deal. And minerals processing is complicated and the really sad thing is we're not teaching it that much, which is not such a good thing. Um, one of the really great examples, and this is a wonderful illustration from a colleague, really good colleague, Michael Motes at Missouri Science and Technology. If you look at copper refining today, so, you know, again, most of it is, is Chinese controlled. So the refining output that we can actually see that's, that's available, you know, for disclosure and, and all of that, what we know is that the bulk of the value comes from the copper itself. The rest of the value comes from silver and gold, yay. 
Um, but everything below nickel, which is the orange or on, on the sides here, kind of the gray block at the top. So all of the other really interesting stuff like selenium and tellurium and so on and so on and so on. Nobody who operates a copper refinery is going to invest billions of dollars to capture those minerals unless there is price discovery, there is a market, you can figure out what the value proposition is for that refining investment. Um, it, you, it makes sense. You can see the returns. Um, I mean, this is just the world of, of business investing uh, writ large, right? So there's a lot to think about on the minerals processing side. Um, what happened was um, along the time that um, the, the Senator Murkowski's committee and, and other people on the Hill started um, stirring the pot on some of these things, Foreign Policy Magazine um, put out a piece um, looking at um, the control of raw materials and mining around the world and came up with terrific numbers, which you could do um, by going through all of the USGS commodity summaries and other things. You could, you could repeat the exercise, but it would be painful. So it's nice that they did that for us so that we can actually see where we stand on some of these things that, are, that we pull into the hopper of what we call critical minerals, vanadium, rare earths. Well, it's been a ton of publicity about that. Um, gallium and so on. I mean, on down the list, their, their positions are dominant, but these aren't the base metals. Foreign Policy Magazine didn't talk about that. Um, we went into the workshop thinking everybody was going to want to talk about the, quote, critical minerals or mainly lithium. Um, but in fact, we spent most of the time talking about copper because the copper industry is notorious through its own booms and busts. We're kind of in a cycle now where copper prices are really low. Um, we use copper for everything. It's a great conductor of electricity for everything that we do. It has all kinds of wonderful properties, and right now it looks like we're not investing enough for what we can see coming down the pike in the future. So this is going to be, you know, kind of an interesting time. One of the things we know, um, this is one thing that we actually know very well, is that ore grades for copper have been declining for years. Um, and this is a reality of the business. The industry has done a lot to try to capture copper from secondary and tertiary sources and so on. Um, but, you know, again, you have to make the investment work. Just to comment quickly on Xi before closing up. So, boy, in the oil and gas industry, we do know this, right? Well, the mining industry has struggled with this forever. We had a terrible incident in Brazil with Vale. More people were killed in that incident than what I can count in oil and gas incidents over the past, I don't know how many years, 30, 40 years. This was a real tragedy. A lot of times, um, mining uh, 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 projects in other countries are controlled by state-owned enterprises that really don't disclose very much about their operations and the safety of their operations. Um, I was going to set up, Todd, I'm going to do this really quickly. The footprint on all of this stuff is something we have to think about. The footprints look awfully similar when you look at large-scale renewable and oil and gas operations. We had an adventure with the dune sand lizard, and I'm going to let Todd pick up on that later on if he chooses to. One other thing I want to caution about, though, um, you know, so we worry a lot about things we can't see, gases that interact in the atmosphere. Um, we need to worry about other kinds of things that, that um, spill out from renewable energy projects. But I want to put a new one on the table that I've been thinking about a lot. Sulfur, which is a very good member of the periodic table, um, we combine that with, um, with fluorine, we get sulfur hexafluoride. The electric power folks in the audience may know F SF6. It's a great insulator for electric power and electrical devices and all of that. Um, our conversations are dominated by carbon-based emissions. We never talk about everything else, and SF6 is a big worry. Um, we're releasing more and more of it into the atmosphere. We're, we're manufacturing more and more of it as we electrify the world, and, and this is a distinct consideration. Um, finally, end of life. Um, so for us here, what we think is we have to wrestle with this. Um, we, it needs to cut across the board. We're worried about it at the mine. Um, how are we managing waste and recovery at the mine? We're worrying about it all the way at the end. And there are some things that really are hard. So that, that special graveyard that Hap mentioned for lithium batteries, well, this is what it actually really looks like. 
Um, lithium batteries are hard to recover. Um, there's a lot of work going on with that. Um, and, um, you know, we need to pay attention to it and make sure that the policy and regulatory framework remains in place. And so what I'm going to do is just, maybe I can flip to the last slide because I love this. This, this comes from one of my colleagues here at the Baker Institute. Um, I, I call it the regulatory soup. She has a more polite name for it, Rachel Meidel, um, who's our fellow in energy and environment. The labyrinth. Um, because the problem is, all the way from project development to end of life, recycling and disposal, a whole bunch of stuff is going on, including hazardous materials management, toxic waste management, because all of this stuff is not exactly stuff we want to put in landfills or incinerators. Um, and to the extent that we can come up with the right rules and laws and other things um, to foster recovery and recycling, we want to be able to do that. Next. Well, thank you so much for Sorry. that. Sorry. <laughs> thank you to the Baker Bots and Baker Institute for allowing me to come here today and have a platform for Occidental to speak on. Let's see. Maybe. Yeah. Well, while that's loading, I'm William Sweetcher. I'm a low carbon strategy analyst with Oxy's Low Carbon Ventures. My background's in public policy with Oxy in DC and on Capitol Hill. And I see now that uh, I'm up and loaded. So the energy transition presents a dual challenge, more energy, less carbon. According to many future energy outlooks, oil and gas is going to be a large part of our future energy mix. So the question is, how do we continue to provide energy while working to negate the impacts of our products? It starts with oil and gas acknowledgement that there is a transition afoot happening right now. Several weeks ago in Chicago, the Oil and Gas Climate Initiative, comprised of 13 large oil and gas producers representing 30% of global production, who Occidental is a member of, made this statement. The climate challenge demands urgent action and significant acceleration of transition to a low carbon future requires sustainable large scale action. It also requires passion and innovation. My CEO, Vicki Holub, her message to be a part of the solution permeates our organization. Climate action is important to employees, the communities we operate in, and our shareholders. Occidental's climate report, which is publicly available, is entitled Positioning for a Low Carbon Economy. So I know this well and are working through an array of technological options to reduce our total carbon impact and aspire to become a carbon neutral organization. This is no small feat and will require us to reduce emissions across our whole value chain and we believe it starts with carbon capture, utilization and storage. By leveraging our experience in CO2 enhanced oil recovery, which is shown when using anthropogenic or man-made CO2, can produce a less carbon intense barrel of oil and additionally, through strategic investments, which I'll touch on in a moment. Occidental is a global company, celebrating our 100-year anniversary next year. In August, the acquisition of Anadarko Petroleum became official and nearly doubled our production to 1.3 million barrels a day, making us the third largest domestic oil and gas operator. But again, we're a worldwide player. In the Middle East, where we've been operating for more than three decades in Oman, Qatar, and the UAE, represented 38% of our total production in 2018. Also, Colombia and South America, where we've increased our acreage to approximately 2 million in 2018. Domestically, we have a large presence in, presence in Wyoming and Colorado, and of course, what you hear a lot of, the Permian Basin in West Texas and southeastern New Mexico. Oxy's chemical subsidiary, OxyChem, is a large producer of PVC, chlorine, and caustic soda, which are key building blocks for a variety of products that we use every day, such as long-term durable plastics and water treatment chemicals. We're first or second in the U.S. in these markets. You've heard me say CO2 enhanced oil recovery, and I want to provide a quick overview for those of you who are unfamiliar. Oxy has been injecting CO2 for over 40 years and treats CO2 as a commodity, which means it's our best interest not to accrue any losses. After primary and secondary recovery, CO2 is injected into reservoirs at high pressure in a supercritical dense phase, dissolves into and displaces trapped oil in the pore space of the rock, which al allows the oil to flow more freely towards producing wells. 
Through multiple injection cycles, nearly all of the CO2 is sequestered in the reservoir and is permanently stored by a multitude of trapping factors. And we can find that we store as much CO2 in the reservoirs as are used in the process and combustion of our product. And early signs of development of the unconventionals highlight an appetite for much more. We find that over time, the CO2 becomes stable and permanently stored. Inhalant oil recovery is key to our carbon neutrality ambitions. We aim to sequester more CO2 in our oil and gas reservoirs than is produced by combustion of our product. We currently employ 34 enhanced oil recovery floods and operate approximately half of the 5,000 miles of CO2 pipelines in the country. Our 14 CO2 recycling compression facilities are key pieces of infrastructure. They allow us to employ a closed loop system in our EOR floods. Some of the injected CO2, which consists of fresh or purchased CO2 and recycled CO2, stays permanently sequestered in the reservoir. The CO2 that is produced with reservoir fluids is separated from the oil and gas products and then re-injected. I began my career with Occidental in 2014 when we were in the midst of working on our first EPA monitor reporting and verification plan, which is key to what we're trying to accomplish and offer a transparent accounting system for verifying the amount of CO2 sequestered and ensuring safe, permanent storage. Both our plans, the first two ever approved by EPA, at our Denver unit in Hobbs Field are publicly available on, all, on EPA's website, and I encourage all of you to take a look. Our 40 years of experience in CO2 injection allow us to really understand our reservoirs. In these plans, we simulate CO2 injection and plume migration, identify any possible leakage pathways, detail our well remediation plans, and discuss our monitoring techniques, all to ensure we're operating in the most transparent and safe way possible. To formalize our efforts to the transition to the low carbon economy of the future, we created Oxy Low Carbon Ventures. I believe we all want to do the right thing when it comes to climate mitigation and the energy transition, but for business, having good intentions does not equate to a profitable enterprise. For real concrete action, there needs to be a business case. Oxy Low Carbon Ventures is making that case through investments in CCUS technologies. Oxy Low Carbon Ventures excuse me, the IEA World Energy Outlook 450 scenario and the IEA Sustainable Development scenario highlight the need for CCUS to play a large role in cumulative emissions reductions needed by 2040. Enter Low Carbon Ventures. Formed in 2018 with a dual charge of enhancing profitability and sustainability of our business while meeting the challenge of reducing atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations. I believe to successfully transition to a low carbon economy, society must have a multi-prong approach and Occidental is pa paving a unique path forward. We aim to leverage our CO2 EOR experience and bring more anthropogenic CO2 into our network, use CO2 as a feedstock for low carbon fuels through direct air capture, invest in strategic carbon capture technologies and build major carbon capture projects to prove CCUS is ready for prime time. As large energy users, we're always looking to increase our energy efficiency and diversify our energy use, and that includes renewables. Develop the natural synergies between our chemical subsidiary, OxyChem, to use CO2 as a feedstock for product creation. And through our technical advisory services team, help others reduce their carbon footprint by helping them sequester CO2. Moving on to some of our recent announcements that fit into Low Carbon Ventures' long-term, short-term, and, me and medium-term vision. One of those is Net Power. Net Power is, a commercial, is commercializing a novel power system that produces low-cost electricity while virtually eliminating all air emissions. The alum cycle is technically known as the direct-fired, oxy-combustion, supercritical carbon dioxide power cycle. Simply, this means it burns natural gas with pure oxygen and uses supercritical carbon dioxide to turn a CO2 turbine and inherently captures all emissions, CO2 included. Net power can be a cornerstone of the global energy system by providing carbon-free, affordable, and flexible power from natural gas. The company is now operating a 50 megawatt demonstration plant in Laporte, Texas, as pictured here on this slide, and we're currently working with Net Power to, on siting for a 300 megawatt commercial scale plant in the Permian Basin. Speaking of decarbonizing our own electricity supply, 
Occidental is constructing a 16 megawatt solar generation facility near Odessa, Texas that will supply electricity to an adjacent Occidental enhanced solar recovery field and the project will reduce Occidental's operating costs and the carbon intensity of its operations. It will cover 120 acres, 174,000 PV modules and the ribbon cutting ceremony is actually taking place tomorrow. In addition, Oxy Low Carbon Ventures has made a significant investment in carbon engineering a British Columbia-based direct air capture company pulling CO2 directly from ambient air. Recently in the news, Occidental and Carbon Engineering announced that they are working together to put the first commercial scale direct air capture system in the Permian Basin, which will capture 1 million tons of CO2 per year with a target operational date of 2022. What kind of carbon capture talk would this be if I didn't at least mention 45Q once and thank Congress for the expansion of the tax credit and the Bipartisan Budget Act? Occidental announced the first project as a direct result of 45Q, and we foresee many more to come. White Energy is an ethanol producer in the Panhandle of Texas, and applying carbon capture to their facilities will capture approximately 700,000 tons of CO2, or 40% of new cars sold in 2018, and use the CO2 in our enhanced oil recovery operations. Finally, we look at CO2 utilization and converting captured carbon into valuable products. Fuels, chemicals, building materials, plastics are just a few of the options here. A colleague of mine once told me, we're just letting chemists loose on CO2 utilization and we've just started to scratch the surface on the ways to utilize captured CO2 in a valuable way to society and it's always stuck with me. There's a new report from the IEA putting CO2 to use. I encourage you all to take a look. And according to that report, global estimates of CO2 use range from one gigaton per year to seven gigatons a year by 2030. Oxy Low Carbon Ventures is looking to grow the CO2 use market well beyond enhanced oil recovery and sequestration. And I want to thank Baker Botts and Rice again for hosting this event. And I hope that I've inspired folks to take a look at your own portfolios to understand how decarbonization and economic growth can work in tandem. Thanks. I'm Todd Staples and I currently serve as president of the Texas Oil and Gas Association. It's an honor to be here with you today. Um, if I've decided that if my enthusiasm can match half of Dr. Foss's this morning, my day will be a success. Uh, I'm delighted to have the conversation with you today and appreciate the Baker Institute and Baker Botts giving you this forum to do so. I know that many of you are thought leaders throughout our state and nation. You are working on solutions to the challenges that we face today. And I can tell you that members of the Texas Oil and Gas Association are right there at the forefront finding solutions to the challenges that we are discussing here this morning. Um, the Oil and Gas Association, Texoga, we're celebrating our 100th year, uh, celebrating the success of the industry, what it's meant to the development and growth of our state and nation, and what the next 100 years will mean. You'll be comforted to know, I think, this morning that it's not guys like me determining policies at Texoga. We have about 15 standing technical committees. I see some of our scientists in the room today that participate in these committees, geologists, seismologists, hydrologists, engineers of varying disciplines, attorneys with various backgrounds that are coming together and helping shape uh, and, and foster the association and the positions that we take. And it's an exciting thing when you get that kind of talent in the room and what they're capable of, uh, of developing and the solutions that they're able to solve. So as we move forward, just real quickly, and we're able to get to the Q&A session, I think it's exciting when you think about what we have here in Texas. I mean, from production to pipelines, to our processing, to our ports, this has positioned Texas to be the number one producing state in the nation and the United States to outpace other countries to be the global leader today. That means a variety of things when it comes to shaping the global dialogue, the conversations about where we're going, and we're certainly glad that Texas is in this role and that we're, we're playing such a dominant role today and what that means to the future. You know, when you think about what it means to Texas, there's three numbers, I think, I hope on the slides behind me today. Oh, no numbers. That's odd. Technology hadn't solved everything yet. Maybe that'll populate. But if it doesn't, there's, click it again. 
How about that? <laughs> Training one-on-one for, the, for this is what we need. Thank you. This is a team here this morning, team effort. So if you don't remember anything else I say today, I hope you think about the three numbers that are now on the screen, 30, 348, and 14. The Texas oil and gas industry today represents 30% of the entire economy of the Lone Star State. 30% of the GSP of the 10th largest economy in the world. That's kind of a big deal. Uh, Governor Abbott likes to talk about the Texas economy being larger than the Russian economy today, and that makes him more powerful than Putin. Uh, (laughs) We think that oil and gas obviously is the reason that our economy is so dynamic today. Because oil and gas is invested in Texas so heavily, it's creating direct jobs to 348,000 Texans. 348,000 Texans have a direct job because of oil and gas today. And 14 represents $14 billion, which is the number that oil and gas companies paid in state and local taxes and state royalties last year. These dollars are fueling the Texas economy. They are making a difference. We're not only fueling our economy, but we're fueling education as well. How about this? I didn't know all this was in the, in the PowerPoint. I'll have to turn around more. So we're fueling the economy, but we're fueling education as well. Because of the investment in oil and gas today, our state's permanent school fund is the largest education endowment in the nation at $44 billion changing lives fundamentally, creating opportunities. Now on the backpacks, there's a couple of logos of schools, right? This is to remind me to talk about the Permanent University Fund that is funded by oil and gas. The thing that is troubling to we Aggies is that that fund is divided up two thirds for the Longhorns and one third for the Aggies. My, uh, I, I'll say it before they, someone in the audience does. My, my Longhorn friends remind me that the reason that it's two-thirds, one-third is because the Aggies got first choice. I, I, uh, and considering the ranking of our football team is on a declining curve this year, that is really troubling for me today. My, my son has actually two degrees from UT, and I'm still going to counseling over his decision. I want you all to know here. But my, my neighbor is a, is a freshman here at Rice. Uh, we got a full scholarship for his academic prowess, and we're certainly glad that we're blessed in Texas to have many institutions of higher education. Uh, my friend, the former state senator, Kevin Eltaf, who is currently chair of the UT Board of Regents, recently announced that they are offering full scholar- scholarships, uh, full scholarships to students whose families earn less than $65,000 a year, and it's because of the contributions of oil and natural gas in Texas while this is possible. So it's exciting to me to see that oil and natural gas really is changing lives. We're living longer, we're living more affluent, we're living better, all because of the contributions. And if you think about ports in the Texas Gulf Coast, we are going to be, for decades a part of the energy conversation because of the production in the Permian and the Eagle Ford and what's happening in the Haynesville and how all that is focused along the Texas Gulf Coast and the export of LNG products around the globe. And it's because of affordable, reliable, clean natural gas that carbon emissions globally are reducing because we know that power generation sources from, um, uh, from other fuel sources that have higher emissions are de- being displaced by clean natural gas. And we're excited that that's going to continue to be a part of it. So as we move forward and think about where we're going and how we're going to get there and what's going to be a part of that, research, cutting edge technology, innovation, development of the products that we are listening and hearing about today as a part of this conference is the solution. We know that natural gas and oil companies are the reason that uh, CO2 emissions are lower in the United States today than they have been in the past two decades. We know that because of natural gas that uh, methane emissions are lower today because of the investments that companies have been making. And we're just at the beginning. We recognize the responsibility, the partnership that we have, but we also recognize that the conversation that we hear in the media today is really not telling the whole story. And so we have to have 
and hope to have that full conversation today. Fracking, you might have noticed, has been attacked in the media, has been misaligned, but it is because of fracking that we have lower carbon emissions today in the United States and around the globe. Uh, fracking has led to the availability of low-cost natural gas that is being the game changer that is making a difference. And we're excited that oil and gas companies in the United States are the leading investors in low and uh, low emissions technology and zero carbon future, and more so than the other private industries in the federal government combined. And this is just the beginning of where we're going. Look forward to the conversation that we have today. Great. Well, thank you very much. That was um, a wonderful set of insightful opening remarks by our panel. So I do want to preserve time for audience questions. So take a moment and, and give some thought to whether you would like to ask a question. We'll turn to that in a moment. But let me just ask each of you on the panel um, a, an opening question. You know, we heard in the first panel this morning uh, one speaker define energy transition in terms of transition to low carbon energy sources. I'd like to hear from our panelists, what does energy transition mean to you? How long will this transition last? What technologies do you think will be dominant? Uh, let's start with you, Tristan, and then work down the line. So uh, thanks, Jeff. I, I think that the energy uh, system is always in transition. Uh, when uh, oil was discovered, uh, 150 years ago in Pennsylvania, coal didn't suddenly go away. Uh, and when uh, people started driving cars, we still used coal. When nuclear power was invented, uh, or harnessed, I should say, we didn't stop using oil. Uh, and uh, I think we're just seeing more of that continue, and maybe at a faster pace with, with uh, different kinds of energy, but uh, I think we're always in transition. Um, well, so to me, it would have to include a transition in thinking, um, and and I think in some places where people have been resisting, perhaps doing some of the same things that we've had to do in the conventional energy businesses to meet those she goals and objectives are going to have to be accommodated in any new businesses that get done, as well as the, the minerals and materials value chains that support them. Otherwise, we're not going to be better off. And I, I think this is a hard part of the discussion. All of the, the devils in the details that, um, you know, in the, in the political uh, debates and open discussions kind of are getting swept under the rug. It doesn't do us any good as societies if we can't actually talk about everything that's gonna to need to be done. All the lawyers in the audience, you guys have to go back and relearn mining agreements and arbitration related to minerals access. And one of the things we didn't get to include in the workshop was intellectual property protections. I can't tell you the number of people that are trying to get things commercialized and are running into IP issues all over the place. Um, we don't know really what the emissions effects of alternative energy technologies and the supporting supply chains are. And this is a huge gap, and it's something that we've been talking about a lot internally, what has to be done to close that. Um, we know some things. We know that battery manufacturing, for instance, is incredibly energy intensive. Wherever you see things that are really energy intensive, you tend to see a lot of emissions output. It's no accident that the Chinese investments in coal are in the play areas where battery manufacturing is. It's where their own minerals are located and so on. So there's a lot to think about. And, and I think that I'd, I need to see some sign that you know, people are really willing to wrestle with those things. I would agree with Tristan that the energy landscape is always evolving and the challenge of meeting the objective of Paris loom very large and we're going to need every single technology at our disposal if we're going to meet those objectives and I do just want to underscore that there is a sense of urgency. Um, you see the youth movements all across the planet urging climate action and it's time for large companies to come to the table to try to figure out how they can be a part of the solution. And here at Oxy, we are taking a neat path towards CCUS. And 
it's going to be interesting, and I do believe it'll take time. But again, there is urgent urgency in the matter. Energy transition certainly means a lower energy future, lower emissions future, uh, without without a doubt. And our member companies embrace an all of the above energy portfolio. We firmly believe that these energy sources must have the dialogue around them to realize the life cycle of other energy sources, the efficiency of other energy sources, and the reliability of those energy sources and what that means to developing countries around the world. Uh, certainly, I think we would all agree that the environmental standards of the United States of America outpace any other country that is a large energy producer, without question. And so, if we follow the mantra that we hear today about keep it in the ground and divestiture, what does that mean? It means production in other countries that don't follow the same standards, that don't have the same guidelines that we have. And we think that needs to be a part of the conversation. I think Michelle's one of her slides I saw was a glimpse of a landfill in Casper, Wyoming that is home now to 900 wind turbine blades that had a life cycle and now they're filling up landfills. Those were conversations that you don't hear when I saw the climate strikes the last two Fridays in a row that marched in front of um, our offices there uh, in Austin on the way to the state capitol and had some interesting gestures sent our way along, along the way with that. So our, our goal is simply to have a conversation about what that means, make certain that it's science-based, make certain that we uh, have the full knowledge and understanding that any energy source produced at scale is going to have environmental impacts of some sort. That's why our member companies are investing so heavily in low and zero emissions technologies. And so we're, we're excited about where that leads us, but we wanna have that bold conversation. Thank you. Let me invite anybody who has questions to go to the microphone first. I'm going to ask one more question on the panel, and if we can get folks lined up at the mics, that would help us with um, efficient asking of questions. So Michelle and Tristan, the, um, obviously a lot of discussion around supply chains that are needed to support a dramatic scaling up of minerals, metals, and other materials required for non-fossil-based energy sources. And this dynamic is made more complex as a geopolitical matter by China's role and involvement in supplying much of the world's critical minerals. So let me ask uh, Michelle and Tristan in particular to share your perspectives on the uh, economic, environmental, and geopolitical aspects of the critical minerals problem. Uh, what role will critical minerals and their supply play in energy transition? Uh, Michelle, let me start with you. Well, to be quick, um, like I said, when we started scoping all of this, when we started planning the workshop and having the workshop, we thought we were gonna be talking about a lot of stuff on the critical minerals list. There is an official critical minerals list that Abby, that Tristan Abby can, can uh, remark on. Um, instead, we spent time talking about a common base metal, copper. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I, I think that that actually is a lesson um, for everyone, which is that some of the surprises may lurk in some of the more ordinary places than we actually think. I think the, the biggest challenge is that people do not recognize how ubiquitous the, the minerals problem is. Mm -hmm. When I was in the administration, for example, it was extremely difficult to push forward the executive order that created that list of critical minerals that Michelle just mentioned. Not because anybody opposes creating a list of critical minerals, it's just people have only so much time on their hands and they wonder why is this a priority. Uh, and so I, th I think raising awareness of the issue is, I, I know it's a cop out, but we really have to raise awareness of this issue. Thank you. Um, we are running short on time, so let's go to the audience for uh, some questions. We'll start over here. Uh, remarkable event, Can Erjan from Turkish Consulate in Houston, uh, energy analyst. Uh, firstly, uh, one year ago today, Washington Post columnist Jamal Khashoggi went into Saudi Arabian consulate and he never came out. Uh, his memory will not be forgotten. Uh, it's a very hardly known fact that Turkey is the biggest U.S. energy importer in Europe. Uh, what we ask the question, what comes next? So how would you evaluate the U.S. LNG's role in this big transition, energy transition? Thank you. Thank you. I'll maybe open that to Tristan first. 
I, I think uh, U.S. LNG goes where the commercial opportunity is. The U.S. government has uh, virtually no control over where LNG uh, actually flows. We, all we do is approve uh, exports up to a certain level, and then we also approve the siting of the, of the, of the project. But uh, I think as, as the LNG market evolves into a, an actual global market, uh, there's a debate to what extent it already is a global market. It isn't spot versus long, long, long term contracts, but uh, uh, I, I would be really uh, reluctant to predict where and explain where it should go. You know, you know I think the U.S. role in, in, in the energy leadership that we're playing is simply irreplaceable. You think about the attacks on tankers in the Persian Gulf this summer and the world financial markets yawned. The, the attacks on the Saudi oil fields here a week or two ago and there was a little eyebrow raise and now I think WTI is trading less than what it was. The fact that we had the ability and the capability and the infrastructure and the commitments that have been made to move LNG and products and lifting of the export ban across the road, it is a, an enormous stabilizing factor globally and it's a role that I think is benefiting every life on the planet. The fact that the United States and Texas is playing such a leadership role in making those sources available. And we want to be reliable, we want to be stable, and we want to be a partner that can be counted on around the globe. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that great question. Let's go to this side of the room now. Yes, this question is for Dr. Foss. Uh, I'm an international lawyer and mostly what I do is um, set up uh, offshore corporations for uh, exploration or export of oil field equipment and, and whatnot. But, uh, and I mainly deal with Latin America. And what I've noticed, uh, when you were talking about strategic minerals, uh, and I did read the Foreign Affairs uh, article, is that we're faced with a, a, a country, China, that has a command economy, and they will do whatever they think is necessary to achieve the goals that they have stated. And the reality, at least from, from an observer's standpoint, is they are slowly, if, if, if not assuredly, um, beginning to dominate the uh, existence of strategic materials, not only in China, but also um, outside of China, particularly in Latin America and in Africa. Um, more particularly, if they now dominate the energy industry in Ecuador. They own the hydroelectric power. And I am thinking uh, Bolivia, which potentially is the Texas of lithium, uh, the lithium fields in the um, Andes region may come, be coming under Chinese control. And my question, and this goes also for the gentleman from, from the Congress, is do we realize, or is there really some consciousness that a potentially hostile power may eventually control things that uh, would, could potentially cripple our economy? Yes. <laughs> uh, Michelle, would you like to expound upon that answer? <laughs> would you like to say anything more? I don't have anything to add beyond that. I mean, this, and, and, and you know, when we go into conversations like this, I've, I've done now several meetings with groups. I was telling William I did one at, at the, with the young professionals at Oxy yesterday on these subjects. And, and we're not um, targeting a country. We're not, we're not trying to do that here. It is what it is. This is where the data are landing. And now, you know, the, the dilemma is to think about the consequences of that in all its forms. Um, I think it's useful to remember the most powerful law of economics is unintended consequences. And that's true of just about everything that's been talked about so far today, but especially true on this one. Um, and I, I guess from my own perspective, as I've been digging around in this and talking to all of our colleagues in different places, um, uh, including in, in, inside the Beltway and all around, um, my impression is that a lot of this underlies um, in many interesting ways the fundamental dilemmas we have on negotiating trade. I mean, I, th I think this is kind of, you know, playing out in some fairly logical ways in terms of positioning and, and, um, and all of that. And of course here, just to say, we want to be constructive on all of this. Um, and to the extent that here we have open forums and we can bring people in and, and discuss this, I, 
I was mentioning to Ambassador Derision last night, um, it's time now for him to kick into gear on this, so I'm delivering a public message, because we, we're a perfect place to start having some outreach on these things that matter a lot to our futures. This question is for Dr. Foss. Um, if, if you don't mind, I know we're asking you several, but um, when it comes to the critical minerals list and um, the, uh, uh, for the sake of, of research and discovery, I know that, I, I mean, it makes sense that if you can't scale it, why fund to study it? But I was curious for some of the elements that are, there isn't a market for and there may be overlooked, um, but are not being controlled by China or by other, where there's restricted access for other reasons, are, do we have, as for our rice researchers, do we have access to the full spectrum of all the elements when it comes to, for example, metal hydrides and storing hydrogen to make those alloys? Are they going systematically or is it being restricted in scope because we're looking too far ahead to scale? So um, what I'm asking is I don't want us to miss a step in discovery scientifically because we're looking like, well, let's only study the ones we can scale. There may be something in between where it's too expensive to scale, but then we figure out a substitute when we find that missing link. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> and, and, and of course, we already have demonstrations of that. Um, years ago, when copper prices were actually more than anybody wanted to, to pay, the copper industry did a very good job of demonstrating um, what you can recover, um, equivalent to secondary tertiary recovery in oil and gas. Well, over in minerals processing, you can do kind of the same things. Um, and, I, and I think this is an offline conversation. This is the kind of conversation that we actually need people at Rice to be thinking about is exactly this. How do we think about substitutes, incremental gains? Um, you know, uh, certainly uh, this is driving a lot of, of the work on battery chemistries. Um, if you, you know, for people who are, want to develop new anode or cathode designs but but can't see how, you know, can't, can't even get enough um, of a material to be able to test it. I mean, that's how tight the control is on some of these things. Um, those are, are things that we need to learn more about and, and eventually try to do something about. Um, and substitutes could conform, could, could uh, come in, in in a completely different way and disrupt all of our conventional thinking about what we think energy storage or anything else is gonna look like in the future. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's really, it's, it's kind of an open book. That's why this question of what is exactly the shape of, of the demand curves, um, we don't know that. Um, and I don't wanna, I wanna do emphasize one thing because I, I think for a lot of things, um, again, the safety aspect of it is not being considered enough, um, one, one that, one area that we've, we've been looking at very closely is hazmat management of lithium batteries that is evolving as we speak. Um, in FEMSA, uh, FEMSA FAA, rulemaking that's happening right now um, because people are uncomfortable moving this in air cargo, uncomfortable moving it in, in shipping in general. Lithium is very reactive, as you know. Um, what else could could come in that could actually provide some of the the uh, same benefits or maybe even improvements in performance um, that the, the current crop of lithium-based battery uh, chemistries offers. Um, those are really, really big questions and a lot of work has to be done on the material side and then walking over to the material supply chains to try to figure it out. So I uh, understand that we have now surpassed our time. We are the only thing standing between all of you and lunch. Um, <laughs> And so with that, I would just extend the invitation for anybody to come up and talk to our panel. Uh, we'll be glad to stay a few extra minutes and engage with any further dialogue. But with that, let's thank our panel for being here and have a great lunch. You bet. Thank you, Jeff. Good to be with you.